I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started to try to keep this on time here. Uh, today's topic that I have uh, is maximizing your farm's profitability. Um, my name is Bodie Kitchell, National Director of Agronomy for Biodyne and BW Fusion. Uh, just want to take a quick second to introduce my team here. Uh, I've got Sean Nettleton over here. Um, he is, uh, he's an agronomist that covers from southern Wisconsin down to the Mississippi Delta. In the back corner there I have Mason Claude, uh, technical agronomist, covers uh, Iowa and Minnesota. Uh, if you have any questions uh, after this presentation, feel free to reach out to those guys. Uh, Jerry Burton is also in here. Uh, he's our head of sales. So any questions, you can find us uh, just outside or um, I should know this, but uh, Josh Pollock, is it 3303? 3303 is the booth that we're in. So a little bit about BW Fusion, right? The mission of BW Fusion is to educate growers with a data-driven crop nutrition platform and a program focused on maximizing your farm profitability. As you can see in the top picture there, uh, it really starts here. That's our science team. Um, everything from isolation, fermentation, formulation. We've got PhD microbiologists, um, and uh, excuse me, I don't know if that back feeds for me or not. Um, and really our focus is it starts there, understanding what our microbes are doing at a bench level, what their capabilities are, really with a focus on ending here. And, and really how do we do that, right? Um, BW Fusion is, is not, uh, it is not backed by venture capital, it's family owned. Uh, our owners are involved in the business on a daily basis. Uh, from concept to finished product, um, we handle everything. Um, committed to supporting farmers at every stage of the growth process, and we're obsessed with data-driven results, and you're gonna see that, and how do we get to that? It's through a strategic partnership with Agronomy 365. Agronomy 365 has unparalleled information and is a decision-making tool in real time. It's focused on in-season soil and tissue testing, all integrated into a, a dashboard uh, that you can see your results, you can track your results, and you can see how you're doing uh, on your farm relative to folks that have, have raised 300 bushel corn, 100 bushel soybeans. How we use it uh, in, in our side is we use it either for research and development, uh, we use it for growers that are looking to push the needle, but we also use it for growers that are looking to raise the most efficient crop that they can, making sure they understand where to spend money and where not to spend money. So a little bit about me. Uh, I grew up on a family farm in north central Indiana. I'm still involved in the family farm today. Um, we raise corn, um, soybeans, and cattle. Uh, I've been with uh, BW now for going on four years um, and uh, get to work with growers uh, really all over the United States and into Canada. So as you guys can see, you probably have seen Lee Big's Law of the Minimum, right? That's probably nothing new to you. What we kind of focus on is, is maybe there's more to the minimum, right? We understand that nutrition plays a really, really, really key and critical role in crop yield, productability, and health, right? But does it go beyond just your NPK, your sulfur, your calcium, your magnesium, your manganese? We think it does. We think that our, our law of the minimum is focused by what's the carbon availability in our soil? What's the biological activity that we have in our soils? You can see the nutrients there, right? That, that stave is all encompassing of those 11 nutrients that are focused on over here on the left barrel. Photosynthesis, right? This being a big one. Marshner, uh, Marshner wrote in his book that, that plant yield is driven by 96% as carbon, hydrogen, oxygen right, 4% driven by N, P, and K. Should we be focused on this left barrel to influence the largest stave in the right barrel? And we think so. Our focus is developing products that influence photosynthesis, focused on managing ratios and relationships inside of the plant with plant nutrition to try to keep it healthy. Plant health, obviously, you can't have some of the other things and not have plant health. As plant health goes, your exudates go with it. As exudates go, you drive that soil health. What I want to take a little bit of time and talk about is some of the nutrient cycles, right? So this is nothing revolutionary. This is nothing new. What we need to understand is, is how this cycle system works and really what it is revolved around. So as you can see, we can apply, we can apply nitrogen in AMS 
anhydrous, UAN, right? And understand what forms of nitrogen those go in. For example, if I put ammonia on my field, it's going in as NH3, picks up a hydrogen molecule, becomes NH4, becomes stable in the soil, that's ammonium, right? Those of us that do that, we likely, if we're applying in the fall or early spring, we're running NSERV, a nitropyrin, right? The nitropyrin's entire goal, focus, and function is to kill nitrifying bacteria so that we're not converting to nitrate. The moment we convert to nitrate, we have the ability to leach it through the soil profile. As you can see in the next step, there, there's that word carbon, right? Those of you in this room, carbon is probably not a new word to you. You've heard it. You open up a magazine. You get on Twitter. Anywhere you look, it's carbon. We kind of focus on carbon from a different aspect, and we're going to get into that a little bit. What happens when inorganic chemistry binds to a carbon molecule is it changes the form, right? You go from inorganic chemistry to organic chemistry. So the difference between inorganic nitrogen and organic nitrogen is simply either ammonium or nitrate that is bound to a carbon molecule and becomes this weon, water extractable organic nitrogen. Anybody in this room ever taken a, a soil test uh, that was developed by Dr. Rick Haney? Soil health test, right? You can see that metric on there. Water extractable organic nitrogen would be weon. Water extractable organic carbon would be the weoc, and we're going to talk about that in the next phase. Now, we understand there's a tremendous amount of buzz around nitrogen today, right? A lot of the focus is really on N2 fixtures. Can we take atmospheric nitrogen, convert it into a usable form for our plants? Now, we have N2 fixtures that we've identified. We've identified over 200 strains of microbes. We use anywhere from 28 to 32, depending on the consortiums that we use and what we're going after. What we're going to talk about today is a little bit different than the N2 fixtures, and the reason why is this. Biological nitrogen fixation actually takes more carbon, more carbon for that biological nitrogen fixation to occur than if the plant takes it up by itself. So if the plant takes up nitrate or ammonium, we know that there is an energy draw that is on that plant, right? We know that it is taking sugars, starches from that plant to convert that nitrogen into a protein. N2 fixers also, if they, if they exist in their, their, their natural state, N2 fixers don't fix atmospheric nitrogen in the presence of nitrogen. So if you have elevated levels of nitrogen in your soil and you put an N2 fixer out with the focus on trying to get that N2 fixation, it's not going to happen. And the reason it's not going to happen is what we just talked about. Because the energy demand on that bacterial cell is so great to go through BNF, it's not going to do it if it doesn't have to. Ammonifiers, you can see that, right? What are ammonifiers? Ammonifying microbes are microbes that break in organic in, so water extracted organic in, to inorganic in through an ammonification process, okay? So it is, it is a part of nitrogen management. It is absolutely a key part of the nitrogen cycle. Whether it goes in as nitrate, you hook it to, maybe it's a humic product. Maybe you have elevated carbon levels in your soil. When that nitrate goes in and it hooks to a carbon molecule, it then changes back into the weon pool. That weon pool, if you have ammonifying microbes or you apply ammonifying microbes, have the ability to take what was once nitrate and release it back as ammonium and start the cycle over again. In our teams of microbes that we have identified and utilized, our focus is really on the ammonifiers. If there is organic nitrogen present in that soil, your ammonifying microbes will go to work at breaking that down. Now, here's the downside. A lot of people are going to ask, well, how many pounds of nitrogen? If I want to get really efficient and I'm going to use these microbes, how many pounds of nitrogen can I cut? Well, for those of you that don't know, an agronomist's favorite answer is what? Depends. Okay? So, I'm going to tell you what everybody else tells you. It depends, the reason why, right? Let's go back to 365 and why we use it. I'll give an example uh, that we did uh, out of uh, Canada. Uh, we had a partner up there that utilized uh, our 401 technology. And they started off taking soil samples from a treated and an untreated spot in the field. The treated had elevated levels of weon. It was over 200. 200 pounds of water extractable organic nitrogen. They utilized 401 in that soil system. They took treated and untreated samples throughout the growing season. And after the application of 401, 
They reduced the 200 pounds down to 120 pounds. Ammonifying microbes made 80 pounds of nitrogen available. Now, here's the great thing. That's 80 pounds. That's a significant reduction or availability of nitrogen that you didn't have to pay for. The bad side of it is, is that if you're from Texas, if you're from southern Illinois, and if you have a soil that doesn't really stop or doesn't really slow down, and you're not in a manure system, you probably don't have organic end levels of 200. Soil sampling, 365, validating everything that we do, the things that we talk about up on stage, at our booth, the things that drive us is proven by 365. The reason that we talk an awful lot about the soil and the tissue testing is, is if you want to refine your nitrogen management program, if you're not looking at these metrics, I'm not sure that you can get it to as efficient as what you want to get it to. The carbon cycle. This cycle is probably one of my favorite, uh, most favorite ones. Um, you, you saw it in the last slide here. Uh, again, right here, right? On either side of that. There's three pools that exist in our soils. We're starting to identify those. We're starting to be able to take those in a soil test, right? You have a plant available pool. For those of you that use a soil test developed by Dr. Rick Haney, that's designated as H3A. That's using root exudates and deionized water as your extraction process. In the middle pool, we have what we call the extractable pool. And the extractable pool is either going to give you a number based on whether you use a Bray, a Malik, or an Olsen, or ammonium acetate, or a DTPA for an extraction at the lab. Now there's this far pool on the left-hand side, right? This is the one that we're not measuring at a lot of labs today. That's the total pool, right? It's using total digestion, using sulfuric acid, a really low pH to extract or pull all of those nutrients off the soil colloid. We've seen numbers in the total pool of phosphorus at 997 part per million. Now a Bray soil test on that same soil might show a 30 or a 40. One thing that I want to make sure that we understand when we leave this room is, is the use of biologicals. I tell people it's not magic. What we're trying to do is cycle each pool of nutrition. And we're going to talk about that in an upcoming slide. We talk about carbon, the reason that it's important, right? Does anybody remember row crop cultivating as a kid or a younger person? Maybe we're still doing it today, right? Okay. My family, uh, you know, I, again, I farm with my dad and my grandpa. And how about anybody side dress anhydrous? Anybody do that? Okay, yes, I am from a biological company. No, I'm not going to condemn you if you side dress anhydrous. So you can be honest with me up here, okay? I remember watching my grandpa drive by a guy that was side dressing ammonia, and he said, man, he said, that anhydrous is unbelievable nitrogen. I said, well, why is that, grandpa? He said, well, just let's come back and watch that corn tomorrow just grows, it explodes in growth. Was it anhydrous? Answer's no. What do we do? We opened up the soil, we oxidized, we brought O2 in, we oxidized that total carbon pool into CO2, we released it, and what do we know? We know that CO2 drives plant growth. We know that everything that we do focuses around carbon. Our farming practices should start to do it as well, right? So we see this. This is really more of a catch and release system. We don't necessarily want to build your WEOC levels if we can't release them through the growing season. The reason is, is as you have microbial activity, that speeds up. We know that you're going to gas off or you're going to release carbon dioxide. As you release carbon dioxide, again, remember, 96.6 and 3.4, right? 96% of our total yield is driven by carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The other 4% driven by NPK. If we can increase the microbial activity in our soils, we can take that organic matter fraction, which would be the middle pool, turn it into the WEOC, water extractable organic carbon, right? If we can increase that pool, that's our food source. That's the food source that drives the entire biological system. A lot of the soil samples that I look at, that my agronomy team looks at, the one thing that we look at, the most important so metric on that soil test that we can look at is what your WEOC levels are. Right? Let's think about it. How many in this room have raised 100 bushel soybeans? How many people want to raise 100 bushel soybeans? Okay? Let's think about it, right? 
If 100 bushel soybeans, right, and we know that one pound of nitrogen, or one pound of, or one bushel, sorry, of soybeans needs five pounds of nitrogen, how many pounds of nitrogen do we need for 100 bushel soybeans? 500. How many of you are applying 500 pounds of nitrogen to your soybeans? Not very many, right? So the next question is this. Anybody in this room have irrigated soybeans? Okay, so when I give these presentations, typically say, well, we all know, Bodie, that it's rain in August that determines what our soybean yields are. That's gonna be the limiting factor to whether we have 100 bushel soybeans or not. I said, okay. Anybody in here ever walk their soybeans sometime in that mid-August time frame? Anybody ever done stand counts, node counts, pod counts? Anybody ever plugged it into the app at Purdue University? You think them people can't count? I challenge you to do it, because what you're going to come up with is 330 or 340 or 350 bushel soybeans, right? You will. But then I'm going to ask you, from sometime in August to sometime in September, where does the 280 bushels go? Because you guys all said, not all of you, some of you said that you have irrigated soybeans. Well, if it was just purely about the rain, all we got to do is irrigate, right? One of the things that I found fascinating in this carbon cycle was this. We took what we call the indicator complete soil test. It was developed uh, in, uh, in South Dakota, Next Level Ag Labs, um, by a guy named Jason Schley. Uh, he's in this room. Uh, Jason and I um, ran into each other by dumb luck. Um, and, and I really started to understand things at a deeper level. One of the trials that we did was we took, we took soil samples through the growing season of a soybean crop. And it was absolutely fascinating because we had the ability to build carbon levels through vegetation and early reproduction, right? So how do we build carbon? Root exudates. The healthier the plant, the more exudates they're pumping, right? It's not from growing a seven foot tall cereal rye cover crop. It's from how healthy is that plant. Remember, the 96.6 and the 3.4, right? What I didn't expect to see was about sometime in that R2 time frame, we watch our carbon levels absolutely crash. They absolutely crashed. How many people understand or know that there's a carbon to nitrogen ratio that exists? Anybody? You believe it, right? Carbon to nitrogen ratio of your soils, carbon to nitrogen ratio of your uh, plant matter, right? Whether I grow corn, soy, wheat. You also have carbon to nitrogen ratio of biological activity, right? If we want N2 fixation, sometimes on soybeans we inoculate them, right? The reason that we inoculate soybeans is to put those Brady rhizobium there on the roots to get that nitrogen. Bacteria has a 5 to 1 C to N ratio. For those 100 bushel beans that we want to raise, it takes 500 pounds of nitrogen. That just means that it takes 2,500 pounds of carbon to raise 100 bushel soybeans, unless you're going to apply every pound that that soybean needs synthetically. Folks, if you want to push your soybean yields, a lot of it is going to come to understanding the carbon cycle, understanding the WEOC levels in your soil. It's one of the most important metrics that we can look at on a soil test. The other thing that we talked about is, is again, right, if you guys are like me, you probably loved eighth and ninth grade chemistry. And if that wasn't enough for you, you loved it in college too. You know, I have yet to give a presentation that everybody's like, I hated chemistry, right? I'm right there with you. Don't feel like that you gotta open that textbook. What you need to understand is, is that carbon is the ultimate chelator. And here's why. So we talked a little bit about that pool. Solution P, that's H3A. Again, if you're looking at a soil test of a, developed by Dr. Rick Haney, that's anything designated as H3A, using root exudates, deionized water. That active pool, that center pool, that's the pool that the majority of the industry is focused on, right? So again, Bray, Malik, uh, Olson for your phosphorus extractions, for example. Here's this far pool on the far left-hand side. That's the pounds of nutrients that exist in your soil, total pounds, that we've never accounted for and we've never credited, right? If it's in this pool, 
It's bound to a carbon molecule. Again, it changes the form of chemistry. Inorganic chemistry reacts with inorganic chemistry. Always has, always will, right? I'm speaking to just the men in this room right now. How many of you guys are married in here? How many of you married the same exact person of you just in a female version? Nobody. <laughs> same thing happens in our soils, right? Chemistry reacts with chemistry. If I build my soil levels and I think that if I have a 55 part per million on a Bray P1, and so I'm gonna have some unbelievable phosphorus, what we have to understand is that if it's in this pool, it's tying up with any other counter ion, right? <clears throat> Excuse me, so a phosphorus being an anion, what's it gonna tie up with? Cations such as calcium, magnesium, zinc, manganese, iron, aluminum. Low pH environments, iron and aluminum is what's gonna reach back and tie up your phosphorus. High pH soils, it's your calcium, right? The reason that we focus on carbon is not just because what we talked about, if you wanna push yield, if you wanna drive nutrient efficiency, it comes to right here. Carbon, WEOC, right here, is the food source that drives the entire biological system, but also the ultimate chelator. When we put biology in the soil, one thing that I tell folks is, is that we've been taught to just look at one pool. The majority of us have been taught that this is the only pool that exists in nature, the chemical extraction. You see these arrows that are moving from left to right. As biological activity increases, if you have phosphorus solubilizing microbes, they're taking this pool that we didn't know existed and converting it into the plant available pool. It's not magic, folks. But what I will tell you is, is if you are just looking at getting started into the biological space, understand what your microbe capabilities are. I don't get hung up on the names. I don't get hung up on the genus, the species. What I get hung up on is, is what's their capability? How many of them are there? And what are the environmental conditions that they do really well in? And what are the watchouts? And that's the focus. That's the focus because biologicals as a whole have kind of been looped together, right? But they're not the same. Understanding your capabilities is extremely important. So how do we get this? Keep your WEOC high. We talked a little bit about that. Water extractable organic carbon. Plant stimulation. Healthy plants produce more exudates. More exudates feed your, micro, right, your, your microorganisms. A neutral pH is where biological activity is going to thrive in. Again, Meltdown 401 Biocast. Uh, you can talk to us afterwards more specifically about the products. And then promoting mineralization. Soil temperature, moisture. And as you manage all of those, what you get is a profile full of enzymes, and those enzymes are really going to work at creating that nutrient solubility. So as you can see down here in the corner, what's driving that cycle is microbes. This is a total performance program that we've put together, corn and soybeans, complete, standard. Uh, feel free, you can take pictures of it if you want. Uh, but again, 3303 is a booth that you can see us in. You can talk to us uh, after the presentation as well. This is a product that was launched last year. Full Sun is a product that is focused on influencing each one of these, right? How Full Sun was created was looking at our 365 data that we did in our research and our d development trials, right? What we saw that we really struggled with some, sometime around V6 to really R2 or R3 were the same set of nutrients that kept popping up over and over. We're low, we're out of balance, right? So we created a product called Full Sun. What Full Sun is, is every nutrient that has a direct effect on photosynthesis. Why? Because we talked about this right here. If I have a plant that is photosynthetically active, we're going to get a profile full of enzymes we're gonna get a better WEOC score, and we're gonna get more biological activity. One of our focuses is kind of on this new product line that we came out of is, is, is predictive outcomes. I wanna be able to have a conversation with you. I want our agronomy team, our sales team, to be able to have a conversation with you about predictive outcomes. So what are some of those with Full Sun? Number one, get your pH right on your water, right? Get your pH right on your water. This is a foliar product. We don't want to spray in the heat of the day. We can talk more in detail about that. Those are some of the watchouts. What you're going to see, growers that use full sun, 
kind of regardless of the genetic base they were using, whether it's Syngenta, whether it's uh, Bayer, whether it's Corteva, whatever genetic profile it was, things that we saw were a wider, deeper midrib, right? We saw a more erect leaf, whether that was a floppy leaf structure that we pulled up a little bit, whether it was a semi, uh, semi-floppy leaf structure, whether it was an upright leaf structure, we were pulling those up. The reason that that's important is, is that if your leaf, leaf tip is bent over, everything here, we're not moving any of those sugars back into the plant, right? 96.6 and 3.4. What are we focused on? We're focused on managing the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. We do that through balanced nutrition. The works products, right? Corn works, soy works, predictive outcomes. Growers that use soy works, what was our focus on that? Was creating a lateral root system, not a, not a side to side, or sorry, a vertical root system, not a lateral root system. We're trying to send those roots deep. Same exact premise with corn works. What are we trying to influence? What are we trying to enhance? Photosynthesis, soil health, exudates, plant health, nutrition, biology, carbon, and we're doing that through stimulating hormonal activity. Biocast Max is a combination of our meltdown and our 401. So these are our microbial teams, right? 28 to 32 of microorganisms isolated by us, fermented by us, formulated by us. Focused on the nutrient cycle, right? Enhancing the utilization, the uptake, and the availability of these nutrients. Amino, fairly self-explanatory. As Mason told me that we, I didn't get very creative when we named the product amino, it is focused on amino acids. The most efficient form of nitrogen that your plants can take up is an amino acid. Humacal, this product was created because a lot of our plant available calcium are as designated as H3A. About 99% of the samples that we look at today are deficient in soluble calcium. Humacal goes on at a two gallon rate. We saw anywhere from 50 to 90 part per million moves in our H3A calcium after application. Prime is a combination of that soluble calcium as well as our uh, carbon degrading or carbon solubilizing team of microbes. Uh, that would be 501 or meltdown. And this is really what our focus is on, nutrient efficiency. One thing that I wanna leave you guys with is this. Microbes don't do what they do as a function for yield. They don't care whether your corn, your wheat, your soys make another 10 bushel. Their focus is, is, is there carbon available? If the answer is yes, whatever their inherent capabilities are, whether it's N2 fixing, whether it's ammonification, whether it's phosphorus solubilizing, whether it's potassium solubilizing bacteria, that's what they do. And that's what you need to understand if you are starting to look at biologicals. Is there an ability for an upside in yield with biologicals? Absolutely, we have a lot of data that we have proven on the yield, but our focus is replacing 20 pounds of nitrogen, 50 pounds of P2O5, 20 pounds of K2O, and 100 pounds of Pell Lime when you utilize this system. This might be the first presentation that I've ever done that I actually stayed to the time frame, but I was threatened before if I went over that it would not be good for me. So, I appreciate you guys, I appreciate the opportunity to get up here and speak. 3303 is the booth that we're in. Uh, Sean Nettleton, Mason Claude, Jerry Burton, we're happy to answer any questions afterwards. Thank you.